So on to the second session, we're looking at academic advising for black student athletes. And our first presenter is from Stephen F. Austin University, Rob McDermott, and he'll be presenting first generation student athletes, academic planning and student success. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, sort of some pilot research that we've been doing at Stephen F. Austin University. Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of asking some questions about uh, the student athlete experience, specifically at-risk student athletes, black student athletes, students that have historically been identified as having risk factors as uh, incoming students. So uh, primarily we look at, uh, we've been looking at data related to black student athletes, first generation student athletes, and other at-risk groups. And so what you're going to see is some preliminary research we've done. Uh, my name is Rob McDermott. I'm the assistant athletic director at Stephen F. Austin. I've been there for five years. Spent a couple of years at Lamar University before that. Before that, I was at The Ohio State University, and before that, I was in Canada. So uh, I'm not actually from here. So if, it's, if I sound funny, it's because I'm Canadian. Um, but no, uh, I've, been, I've been working in college athletics now for 15 years, and so I'm kind of familiar with a lot of these trends that we've been talking about in previous presentations. And I think the previous pre presenters have done a wonderful job of introducing some extremely complicated topics, and I'm about to to do the same thing. Okay, my guiding research for, or my guiding question basically came from some research recently uh, published by Joy Gaston Gales in the uh, Diversity in Higher Education uh, Journal this past summer, basically discussing uh, best practices for advising black student athletes. So if you haven't read it, there's an article and it's called uh, Advising Black Male Student Athletes Implications for Academic Support Programs, where the authors uh, present a number of different strategies that academic support service offices who have been successful working with student athletes have implemented and experienced success uh, with academic outcomes. They used a number of institutions that they identified as being exemplary institutions. Uh, locally here, you see Rice University in the Midwest, Northwestern, uh, Notre Dame. There's some private, there's some public, but all of these universities had experienced high academic outcomes and good graduation rates for black student athletes. And so they used these as their, as their case studies. Um, essentially what they resulted, uh, what, what came out of this were two things. One, that there were role identity issues that needed to be overcome, as well as uh, they needed to, or sorry, role identity issues and self-definition self issues that needed to be overcome. And that was part of the problem, so they framed the problem. But then at the same time, they offered solutions. And what they said was the common themes that they found, the threads, all seven threads that came out of these institutions were that these institutions were providing some form of these seven services to student athletes, some form of tutoring and student uh, assistance, some sort of access to a computer lab or study hall, some sort of supervised study session uh, with study skills resources, some sort of freshman specific service, orientation programs, mentoring programs, partnerships with faculties and academic programs, as well as some sort of celebration of academic achievement. So this is what, they, this is what the, the authors had described as being successful. Essentially, the authors conclude, if you implement these seven things, you'll likely experience success advising black male student athletes, okay? That was what they concluded. So that kind of sparked an aha moment. Aha, we're doing that at SFA. Well, not only are we doing some component of those seven issues, we also have three proprietary things that we do at SFA that include cloud-based grade tracking, uh, we have limited study hall, daytime study hall, and we also do a lot of data-driven and analytical progress uh, evaluation, not only for incoming student athlete freshmen, so uh, recruits that we're looking at, but also continuing eligibility. So we use a lot of analytics to determine decisions that we make. Okay, so now we've got the original seven plus the three that I've got, and I thought, what, do we, what can we do with this data and with this research to try and take a look at uh, how these kinds of themes can impact uh, at-risk student athletes? So what we did, oh, actually let me introduce you to, to, to part of the issue, is that we have a small staff. So in addition to everything that Gaston sales, you look back on, on what Gaston said are the exemplary institutions, most of these institutions are large institutions. They have large staffs, large budgets. I was working against a lot of the odds in the sense that we have a small student athlete, uh, a, a, a small school, small staff. There's only f uh, three full-time staff, two graduate assistants. We have fewer than a dozen tutors for the entire academic uh, services department. And I have a budget of less than $50,000 to operate on, and that's including graduate assistants. All of the services that I provide to student athletes, that means all the photocopying, the computer lab, the tutors, everything. Okay, So we need to understand best practices. 
Okay, best practices are vital to what I do because without best practices, I'm just burning money and kids aren't being successful in school. So basically what it came down to was, what are these seven things plus the three proprietary that we're doing, how have they been, uh, or how has that been working out here at SFA? So prior to, the, to reading Gaston uh, Gale's article, the rationale was I did everything I had to do because I was budget conscious, I was cash strapped, I didn't have resources, I needed high impact, high uh, ROI um, practices. We had to make sure everything was data driven. It could not be anecdotal. We had to show success because I was literally hinging the future of the athletic department's academic services on what we were doing. Um, we had to target the correct student athletes and unfortunately with targeting the correct student athletes for all of our services, it also meant we had to make some hard choices and figure out who are the groups that don't need to be targeted because they're not going to be the ones that are going to struggle as much as the ones that need to be targeted. We had to have quantifiable outcomes and we had to create our own solutions. We didn't have money to buy software, we didn't have money to invest in uh, uh, consultants, more staff, everything had to come in-house. So we started off by creating cloud-based grade tracking. I use the uh, University of Texas uh, here on the left-hand side as an example of what they're doing. We basically replicated it using cloud-based technology for zero dollars, and uh, we, we, we track <laughs> everything you're going to see here can be replicated at no cost to yourself. Um, the, uh, we basically uh, track all of the grades for all of our student athletes all the time. Those grades automatically go into cloud-based uh, grade tracking sheets for each of our sports that get updated to our coaches that they can track on their phones, they can track on their iPads, they can do whatever. It's available 24 hours a day. We update it as soon as possible. All that information comes from the academic mentor meetings. Coaches have the information, students have the information, we have the information, zero dollars. Our research question, my research question basically, that comes from this specifically that we'll be talking about today because there are a number of them, but I'm only gonna talk about the one that related to Based on five years' worth of data, from 2010 to present day, has the, have the 10 proprietary themes that we've employed achieved academic, solid academic outcomes so that we could reduce risk factors for at-risk groups, including black male athletes, first-generation students, and others? Have they shown that they've done that? The data, we took the data from all 579 incoming first-time freshman student athletes who came to SFA starting in fall of 2010 to present day. We took all of the, uh, their high school uh, factors, test score factors, uh, first-year outcomes. We only looked at first-year outcomes because beyond first-year outcomes, it became a little messy. So we did first-year outcomes to say, okay, what are our programming? And primarily, we work with freshman student athletes. So what was our programming doing to um, actually impact the uh, bottom line for first-year students? So here's what we came up with. Uh, for those of you who want to line-by-line line this, um, essentially, we grouped all of our uh, risk groups together uh, against their non-risk group peer to come up with the data. Um, we found, and this chart's going to, it's kind of sm uh, small, but basically what we found was there was a significant difference uh, between first-generation student-athletes and non-first-generation student-athletes as far as academic outcomes were concerned. I think that's the laser pointer. It's over here. Okay, first-generation student-athletes as a whole were more likely not to be retained, were more likely to be on suspension and probation. Their GPAs were much lower. Uh, first generation males and their non first generation peers were roughly the same. Uh, what was shocking, because we weren't even looking to examine this group, was what really popped out of this research was first generation females versus non first generation females, which wasn't even the, the, the research that we had dived into. We had di mostly dived into black male first generation student athletes. But what came out of this research was we really need to look at what's going on here with. Uh, first-generation female student-athletes because they were much, much, much more likely than their peers uh, to not be successful, uh, and as well as what we noticed, and this is, a, this is a great finding, was after all of the work that we put into our student-athletes, we were basically coming up with similar outcomes for first-generation black student-athletes, black student-athletes, uh, non-first-generation you know, generation student athletes The big groups that were, that were seeing less academic success were male, first-generation males, first-generation females of any color, and um, basically, oh, sorry, yeah, it was first-generation males and first-generation students of any color and female student-athletes. Um, basically, what the correlation showed was that here we thought going into this research that highest risk factors were going to be black males, um, possibly first-generation. What it came down to was uh, correlation shows 
black had as little to do with any of your outcomes as being first generation and had less to do with your first, uh, first year outcomes than if you were male or if you needed remediation. So basically what that told me is we need to stop targeting black males and start looking at sp specifically in order those who need developmental writing remediation, first generation students of any color, and males. Okay. So really what the research tells me is we were doing a great job with um, sort of negating some of the things that we were sort of expecting to find with our, with our work. So what's the impact of this, Ben? The impact is we've basically in the last three years shot up, had the most improved APR we've ever seen in 2013-14, uh, won the APR award for having the most improved APR in our conference at the FCS level. Uh, we continue to have APR above 970 this year after the fall. We anticipate another year above 970, and that's a dramatic improvement over previous years. So by targeting the right student athletes with the right services, we've been able to impact student athletes in a way that the NCAA is measuring us. Um, but from a budget perspective, we have slashed the budget that it's cost to achieve this kind of success. We have uh, a fewer number of failed classes because we do a better job of providing the services to the people who need it. We have a faster time to graduation because there are fewer failed classes and we use the data-driven analytics to help us advise the student athletes to make sure that they're getting the progress that they need to be successful while still pursuing whatever degree that they, what they want. So what we're using is we're using the data to inform us for best practices for our student athletes. We have fewer fifth-year students because we're no longer having people lingering around, so we're not paying for students who are no longer eligible to continue to complete a degree, uh, which was costing our department a lot of money. We spend less money on low uh, return on investment practices. And now what we've been able to do is we've been able to invest money in the high ROI practices. Our mentoring's been high ROI, the cloud-based grade, tr grade tracking's high ROI, our progression analytics is high, and the data-driven advising is high. Uh, Essentially, the conclusions are, this is great and all, and I appreciate that you, know, you guys have watched what I've been doing at SFA, but what we really need is we really need additional research into this. We really need additional research that's going to look into validating the efficacy of student athlete support services, which ones work, which ones don't, which ones are cost effective, which ones aren't. What's going on with first generation female student athletes is something that we're going to need to do more research about. And then we also need to uh, start to put into, uh, start to quantify the impact of course selection as well well as these progress towards degree things to understand how that impacts uh, student athletes. Okay, so I really think there's all sorts of available research and I look forward to your questions a little bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Um, a reminder to the presenters, I'll be right here to your right, probably pretty visible with these signs. Um, and then I'll give you five, one, and time is up from there and then I'll come to the stage. Our second presenter is from the University of South Florida. Um, his name is Ronald Moses and he's presenting second and 18 Summer Bridge programs and black male student athletes. Okay, how y'all guys doing? Make sure I adjust first. Like I said, I'm Ronald Moses. I'm the athletic academic coordinator at the University of South Florida, working primarily with football student athletes. And this is Title Second and 18, basically cr creating a culture of expectations for my incoming student athletes, particularly male student athletes, academically and culturally. So first, I'll start off with the name Second and 18. And so when you hear Second and 18, you think of down a distance, right? So you think of football, barring any penalties, you have first and 10. Four, four chances to get your 10 yards and you can kind of continue on, right? But when we look at it from the African-American student athletes that's coming in, they typically don't have the same amount of chances. So I said, okay, second down and 18. So they have even less of a chance even further to go because of their experiences and their background in the past. So I called a second and 18. And on the flip side, as a practitioner, this is generally my second chance to kind of influence, enhance, or change 18 plus years of learned behavior, whether it's positive or negative behavior. And so we're trying to get this done within four years when it's already been reinforced over the past 18 years. So we use Summer Bridge program in their freshman year to come in and try to double up on it to kind of influence some of these behaviors and have a good outcome. So define a Summer Bridge program. And if you all do not know what Summer Bridge program, programming is, some people have it, some people don't. Uh, typically occurs the summer between the students graduating and before their first term, and it kind of serves as a bridge between high school or junior college and matriculating into the university. 
It's typically designed as a series of weekly meetings between staff members, coaches, kind of however your life skills director or your academic staff or whoever's involved with that process decides to kind of plan out the Summer Bridge programming process. Uh, promotes transitional skills, utilization of campus resources, note taking, reading, communication skills, time management, goal setting and financial literacy. So this is in essence kind of what it is. Now, in my opinion, at most places, it's kind of watered down. They do it maybe once a week, once every two weeks. They don't really spend a lot of time in Summer Bridge program. We really don't spend a lot of time with this part at all. It's get the athletes in here. They need to hit the weights. They need to run. They need to spend as much time with the strength staff as possible. But the reason why I targeted this time is because what other time are we going to have the athletes this much time where they're only taking six hours of classes and they have to only see the strength coach per day. Why not utilize that time to really get some lessons, especially for the freshmen who are going into college level academics and half of them don't know how to write an email, don't know how to format papers and things of that nature. So this is the reason why we targeted this, uh, this population to use Summer Bridge. So before I get into it, I'll get into some of the risk designations that we'll be going over as well. So when we're defining academically at-risk student athletes, we're talking about a student that requires temporary or ongoing intervention in order to succeed academically, which is typically a lot of our African-American male student athletes entering the university. And conditionally admitted, which a lot of people know, our student athletes coming into most universities, I can't speak for all, are typically, I'm having to write a letter saying, hey, this is gonna be the plan for this guy once he comes in because academically he's not up to par, he's not up to snuff with the general student body entering the university. So from that standpoint, you have to look at it as they're already starting behind because they're in the classroom with individuals that take schools as serious as they take football. So if they're in the classroom with individuals that take schools as serious as they take football and they don't care and they're underprepared, it's kind of recipe for disaster if we don't target this population of student athletes and continue to work with them. And then finally, behavior and cultural assimilation challenges. I think this is one area that has been underrepresented because we kind of focus on the academic part, but we don't focus on how behavior and cultural assimilation kind of factors into the student athletes' experiences and overall their grades. Before I got to the University of South Florida, I was at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and I'm bringing students from Atlanta, Dallas, things of that nature out into Manhattan, Kansas, and those students <laughs> closed up. And as they closed up, that affected their overall experience at the university, therefore affected their, affected their grades, therefore affected our retention rates because we didn't address their needs. On the flip side, I'm in Tampa, Florida, and then we got these guys coming from all over, and they're coming into the city now, and they go crazy, and then we have to affect them as well. So it's just different places you have to face your different challenges. So real talk, this is the program that we set within the Summer Bridge program. And, and how this kind of came about, one summer I had a strength coach come into my office and he's complaining and the coach was wrong. These people coaches brought in, they're too smart, they're too slow, they're underprepared, they're underdeveloped. I can't put them out there with the rest of the guys that are going to get killed. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, okay, underprepared, underdeveloped. They can't go out there with the rest of the guys. Kind of where, where does that correlate? Where does that correlate? So he's saying there's two smart, it's too underprepared. So they gave me a 250 pound offensive tackle. They want me to put 20 pounds on them before the season starts. So where does that start? I got a guy coming in with a 16 reading score and I'm trying to get him to a certain point before school starts. So it's correlated. So I say, coach, what's your plan? He said, well, I have to double him up with the protein. I have to give him double workouts. I have to work with him every day. He's gonna come back in. We're gonna make sure we kind of take care of that. So I'm thinking, okay, why don't we equate that over into academic services? So if they're this underprepared, why do, why do we still go by the model, okay, we'll do summer bridge program or we'll do academic preparedness maybe once or twice a month, you know, during the summer. And if you equate it, you wouldn't do that with your 270 pound offensive tackle that you want to get 300 pounds. So if you expect us to get the students in the classroom and to be able to compete with 300 pounders academically, we have to double up as well during the summer and be able to, to have those students. So as he's talking, a light kind of went off in my head and said, hey, we, we need to do something where we double down, not once a week, not once a month, but twice a week, twice a week for an hour. That's not a lot of time. I mean, to most coaches it is. It's like, no, 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 we have to do, it's, almost, it's only so much lifting you can do in a day. You know, your body can't atrophy. So, but your brain, you know. So that's the whole idea behind this. And the other part is, we focus so much on your SAC committee and your leadership councils, nobody pays attention to the bottom 5%. And the idea behind this program is focused on the bottom 5% of student athletes that fall behind academically and have trouble adjusting culturally. 
at-risk intervention programs not only increase overall team academic success, but has a direct positive uh, intervention um, on retention efforts. So we'll kind of go into the program goals of the Real Talk program that we started. And academic enrichment, obviously, is, is the main thing. They have to be eligible. And we're going to call a spade a spade. This is it, the point. You can try to save the world, but they have to be eligible. I mean, at the end of the day. So academic focus with the emphasis on athletes should see at least a minimal impact on their improvement because we're going to work on academic skills throughout the summer, such as learning how to write an email, such as learning what double space is, how to save your paper, how to, how to use different formats when you're going through uh, your papers and going through the classroom services. With the reinforcement plans established through this program, we can use this to the academic staff to serve as early indicators of who's going to struggle going into the fall. If we can identify who might struggle during the summer, we'll have a better plan as far as maybe majors, maybe classes, things of that nature that we can pick kind of going into the fall so we don't isolate the student athlete, we're not throwing them out in the deep end, or we're not putting them out there as a 275 pound offensive tackle trying to go up against Robert Kimdichi, that we can kind of have them prepared to be able to hang in the classroom environment and be able to be successful. Social readiness is the other side of it, where we're teaching students to understand the backgrounds that they come from and how to behave in a positive manner socially where we're teaching them the backgrounds that they come from and how to behave in a positive manner socially. We, we're bringing in athletes, most of your top four-star, five-star kids is coming out here, are, they come from deprived situations. They come from where smoking weed might have been the norm. Their parents smoke weed. That's the norm. That's the norm behavior. Sagging pants is the norm behavior. So you're bringing them and you're telling them, no, it's wrong. That's 18 years of learned behavior. So you can't expect to just say, say, tell somebody that's wrong and they just pick up on it right away. So these are the things and these are the lessons that we're trying to reinforce in their head and understand why I'm not trying to tell you to change who you are. I'm not trying to tell you to assimilate into white culture. I'm trying to tell you how to be who you are while understanding social and societal norms and how to be yourself within the social and societal norms. So drugs, alcohol usage is, is one of the major things and proper communication. A lot of our kids don't know how to communicate and that goes back into writing emails. That goes back into communicating with professors, communicating with coaches and communicating with peers. So program implementation, basically for this program, uh, student athletes met twice a week. They met twice a week in small group formats that I broke them up in. And it was very closed door, it was very small. I didn't have coaches in there, I didn't have anybody in there because I wanted real conversations. I didn't want watered down conversations because they see the AD. I didn't want watered down conversations because they see the academic advisor, or they see their coach. I wanted real conversations with somebody that they were actually comfortable with. So they met twice in a week with the intimate setting for an hour. It was structured, but allowed free discussion. First 15 to 30 minutes was going over whatever topic we were. Hey, this is the topic, I'm introducing it. Let's watch a small video. Let's go over some different sessions. This is what we're gonna talk about. And the last 45 to 30 minutes, kind of established dialogue, um, got some questions. And at the end of each week, they had assignments in order to reflect upon what they did and to reinforce the academic standpoint of this is kind of how classes are going to go, this is how academics are going to go on top of what they're doing in the regular school because everybody knows Summer Bridge, they take the two fluff classes, so we have to give them something real to understand that this is the expectation when you walk into the classroom. The direction of each meeting also was voted on by the student athletes with input from the counselors and staff so they can take some ownership of what they wanted to talk about next. So I said, hey, these are the topics, what are we doing next? We let them vote, we let them have some empowerment, and we let them kind of decide which direction we were going to go. In addition to the individual group sessions, they had monthly mentoring events, they had additional monthly community service, and at the conclusion, we kind of had a general overview where we kind of let them present to their coaches and everybody, and this goes back to the communication piece, what they learned over the course of the summer. The group meeting was held in a way that they empowered the student athletes to take ownership. I'm not sitting here talking to them, preaching to them like I'm doing to you right now. I'm giving you empowerment and ownership to be able to say, the things that you want to say and to have the form to, to kind of say what you want to say, form your own opinions, tell your own opinions with other people, and come up with new opinions at the end. Also, it was not a sounding board for complaints. So you know when you get guys in this thing and it's like, I hate my coach, I hate this, I should have went to Texas A&M and not Texas, coach lied to me. No, this is not a sounding board for complaints. We focused on initial challenges and we focused on solutions. Everything was solutions based. I'll let you complain the whole time, but I'm gonna cut it off at the one time. It's okay, so how? How can we fix it? This was the weekly topic schedule that we used. During the weekly topic schedule, at the end of every week, I sent out 
assignments through email so they can learn how to check their email because y'all know they don't check their email. So I send out assignments through email and if they had missed, us, missed the assignments, reported to the strength coaches and they had disciplinary action. So every week, send out assignments through emails. They have to respond through emails while writing a proper email, while learning how to format a paper. These were the topics, orientation, reality checks, self-identity, social improvement, uh, importance of a college education, substance abuse, police crime, societal norms, communication, healthy identity, sexual healthy partners, mental health, gangs and discriminatory groups, how to learn to adjust to alternative culture, that's the Kansas thing I'm talking about, and financial literacy. So moving on, these were the results right here. Results, that last GPA, that first one, I wasn't there for that, but this is what, <laughs> this, is what this is what we did and this is what we fixed from the first fall to last fall, this fall, arrested suspensions down 35%, and that is it. I'll take your questions later on. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, next up, we have two ladies, Thais Roxbury and Brittany Washington from the NCAA, it looks like. Um, and they'll be presenting NCAA Accelerating Academic Success Program. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Tyce Roxbury from the NCAA. I'm the educational research scientist there. And uh, as of January 20th, I'll be there. I'll have been there for seven years. This is our intern, and I'll let her introduce her. Hi, my name is Brittany Washington, and I am a postgraduate intern in the Office of Inclusion for the NCAA. Okay. So today we're going to talk about um, our Accelerating Academic uh, Success Program. Brittany came up with the idea to come and bring this uh, program to this uh, summit so we can put it out there and clear up some of the misconceptions. So when I was reading the call for papers for this summit, there was a question that said, uh, what are some of the common misconceptions that you want to clear up? And I think uh, that stood out to me because we do face a lot of scrutiny in the national office about what the NCAA does and what it doesn't do. Um, so I uh, put some of them here. The NCAA doesn't care about the education of its student athletes, um, only cares about the competition, mainly football and basketball. I mean, our premier events are the Final Four, um, men's Final Four. So um, then we get the, the calls that, oh, you're exploiting the student athletes, and then the slaving, the slave trade, and all this. And so, you know, that's hard for us when there are people in a certain departments there that are doing good things. So we wanted to come here and talk about the um, AASP program and show you exactly what the NCAA is doing to um, help progress the education of our black student athletes. Go ahead. So just showing you some of the articles that I'm sure you've seen that we see we get a daily email that shows all the good articles and the bad articles that are out there about us. I mean daily, 8 o'clock in the morning that email is there and we're seeing all the headlines about this so you can go to the next one. Systematic exploitation. Go ahead. Rip for abusing athletes, <laughs> the players. Go ahead. Um, we have professors out there that are constantly trying to call us out and do research and show us what we aren't doing. Um, but we have our own research staff that I'm a part of that, you know, we try to show what we are doing to f move these outcomes. Go ahead. Um, the, the front of our building, thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> Athletes are getting degrees, but do they mean anything? You know, we're constantly trying to debunk this myth. Go ahead, Brittany. And um, a, a lot of articles that tell us what we should be doing. And so we want to, again, uh, bring this program to you and show, show you all that we are doing it through, these program, through this program. Go ahead, Brittany. 
So I think there is the underlying issue is that currently, this is the most recent number that I have from our research staff, um, the total number of student athletes, 489,698, and our African American student athletes, 77,390. So then I broke it out by sport, and we can see that some of the highly visible sports, um, basketball, 58% of student athletes, our basketball student athletes are um, African American. Women's basketball, over 50%, and then uh, men's football, almost 50%. And then we also listed some of the, the other uh, sports here. Go ahead, Brittany. And so then I go into the HBCU landscape because for this program, the Accelerating Academic Success Program, it's for our, our institutions that are at the bottom 10% in resources. And uh, right now we currently are funding 16 institutions and 75% of those are HBCUs. And so um, HBCUs were designed to support underrepresented groups to provide them access into higher education. Although t some of the students at those institutions do come in underprepared Breeze through this. Um, the students at HBCUs are often from a low income household. Uh, a large proportion of the student athletes Sorry, but I can't see. are first generation college students, as we um, heard in the former presentations. Go ahead, I'll get through this. So then we have the, the resource challenge at these institutions. Right now, we see that uh, the student athletes uh, get half of what is spent at, on average at Division I institutions. So at, on average at Division I institutions, we're spending about uh, 50000 per student athlete. But at these HBC institutions, it's about half, so it's about 25000 So we can see the significant disparity in uh, what is going into our student athletes at these institutions. So. Um, we know they operate with significantly fewer resources, and not only the money, but the staff. So we've seen in previous presentations that some of these institutions have 10 GAs, 10 tutors, uh, staffs of 15 people. But in most of the schools that we're giving um, this grant funding to, they might have one academic staff member, maybe two. Um, but then they're using the money to kind of double up. They're so ecstatic when they can get to having four full-time academic staff members. Um, go ahead. So I'll sit down and uh, turn it over to Brittany and let her be great and talk about the AASP program. Um, so I'm going to talk about the AASP program. Um, it was developed um, in response to the challenges that HBCUs face. Um, the program was initially formed um, to provide a three-year grant for limited resource institutions that have issues um, meeting the APP standards, the Academic Performance Program. Um, so the program highlights a high level of presidential engagement from the grant recipients, also a higher level of funding with the matching requirement, also a commitment to sustainability once the grant period has ended. And we want to make sure that these institutions are going to be able to keep these um, programs going and also a greater um, national office engagement. Um, we have uh, staff liaisons for each uh, grant recipient. So um, the, the grant is divided into two parts. First, the comprehensive grant, and that grant is a three-year grant, and it's a 900 maximum. So over uh, each year, they get 300,000 or whatever that they need. And then you have the initiatives grant, and that's a single grant, and that's um, a single-year grant for $100,000. And here's the um, eligibility requirements. Um, as we said, um, um, the institutions that are eligible are those who are in the bottom 10% of resources. And um, for the comprehensive grant, they have to meet part one. Um, they have to be in the bottom 10% or in a conference that at least 60% uh, are in the bottom 10%. Or uh, for part two, the institution has two or uh, less teams below the 930 APR or three teams below the 930 APR, and they, have, they cannot be subject to level two or level three penalties in the last two APR years. Um, in regards to the grant management and oversight, 
for the comprehensive grant, each grant recipient has an oversight committee um, that consists of key athletic administrators and also um, with a high level of presidential oversight and commitment. Um, they have a team of NCAA staff liaisons who um, go on two campus visits a year. Um, also, um, mid-year and end-of-year reporting um, and annual renew renewal assessment. Um, for the initiative grant, um, it's less stringent. They have just an end-of-year report, a campus visit, and then a staff liaison. So for the expected outcomes um, for the grant, um, the point is to have su six successful um, funded initiatives that's going to support the academic success uh, for student athletes, um, being able to sustain the funding, the funded initiatives once the grant period has ended, um, sustain commitment and engagement from the president or chancellor, um, teams moved beyond or, or be a, above the 930 APR mark, um, improve individual student athlete performances, um, improved uh, retention and eligibility, um, and also so increase um, graduation rates. So we currently have 16 um, comprehensive grant recipients and three initiative grant recipients. Um, class one is at the end of their um, grant period um, and they've had a successful run and as a result of that they're going to serve as mentors for um, upcoming um, grant recipients um, to develop best practices and also create um, a collaborative environment where they can lean on each other um, and learning um, tasks and tactics um, um, for, for having limited resources. And that's class three. So um, we have specific initiative types that are funded, um, degree completion, staffing, assessment, professional development of staff, renovation, summer and interim term funding, technology and sof software upgrades, summer bridge funding, and services and testing funding. Um, here's some examples. Um, for one of the institutions, they have um, a summer bridge um, program, a, a summer school head start program where they collaborate with entities outside of the athletics department, um, providing students with a six, six unit summer um, credit um, and also a university uh, 100. And then um, there's initiatives that provide services to at risk um, student athletes, which often are in um, high concentrations at HBCUs. Um, one institution has the ProPath initiative, and that's for um, student athletes who um, have expressed interest in pr performing um, at the professional level. Um, it allows them to um, develop career plans, um, goals, and um, participate in um, workshops. Um, most importantly, one of an, an important initiative is, is in, um, increase, an increase in staff. Often these institutions are operating with um, a low number of individuals and that has sometimes a direct um, negative impact on the student athletes because they, they don't have the ability to reach all of them. Um, then there's the, a boot camp for student athletes who come in with a 2.0 or between a 2.0 and 2.49. And Thais is going to talk about the outcomes that we've seen to date. So uh, as a, on the research staff, we obviously have to uh, show that this money has been going to good use. So I have to kind of do the research that shows the impact of the program. And that's what phase we're in right now for our class one institution since they just wrapped up their three years in December. So some of the outcomes that we're looking at uh, right now is uh, the increase in the number of student athletes, the increase in their academics, obviously the APR, GPA, graduation rates. Um, since graduation rates, the, the GSR, it's kind of a delayed metric. We're looking at real-time graduates. Um, the increased staffing, we're, we're monitoring how many staff are added um, and how that affects the uh, staff to student ratio. And it's helping tremendously. It, it might half it sometimes if they add another. Um, uh, the infrastructure, we're getting a lot. Time is up. But if you have any questions about the outcomes, um, I'm more than happy to answer questions about the program uh, after this. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. And for our final presentation of this session, um, we'll have Devin Walker from the University of Texas, and he'll be presenting The World Beyond Sports, From Foreclosure to Exposure. All 
All right, how y'all doing today? Good? All right, my name is Devin. I'm from Los Angeles. I went to the University of Wisconsin for my undergraduate. Go Badgers all day. Um, y'all don't know how good of a win that was for Wisconsin versus USC for me personally. I've been waiting for about 13 years for that. Anywho, um, I got a question for y'all. In this country, in this country, give me some words that you associate with black. Powerful. Athlete. Hood. Ghetto. Nappy. I do this every year with my students, right? First class, that's one of the first classes I do. I write black on the board, white, Latino, da 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 da. And for black, there's always very specific and it's always the same, right? It's the same box that we're put in, right? When I went to the University of Wisconsin, from Los Angeles, people wanted to talk to me about three things. Gangs, rap music, and sports. I couldn't evade it, right? I couldn't get away from it. Um, so I decided what I was gonna do, I was gonna study abroad, I was gonna get out of Wisconsin, right? And when I got out of Wisconsin and I studied abroad, I studied abroad three times in Quebec, Canada, London, and South Africa. What I realized was that Although I thought I was outside the box and I was thinking outside the box, that ideology of living within America in a white supremacist country was permeating all through me. It had me thinking things that I didn't know I thought, right? So ideology is a powerful thing, and I realized that for me as a black student, it was pretty, pretty powerful, and I'm mad light-skinned. So I thought, <laughs> right, like, what about for a black student athlete with the additional labels, right? And they big, and they strong, and everyone can see them, right? At Wisconsin, people thought I was an athlete. I said, I'm, bro, I'm 5'7", about buck 65. <laughs> All right, like it's not happening. So you just see how powerful these, these limitations can be. So what's happened is we've seen a lot of research on this idea of athletic identity foreclosure, right? Y'all heard of that? Can someone, you clap, well, what's identity foreclosure? What's athletic identity foreclosure? Yes, ma'am. Exactly, right? I, I was thinking about it last night. It's like a clam, right, in the ocean. There's all this out there, but it just closes, and all they can see is within that little shell. And so that's all they can become, right? So what are some of the negative attributes about athletic identity foreclosure? What comes along with that? What's associated with it? Anxiety, Pressure. depression, internalization. internalization, isolation, right? Delayed consciousness. Uh, all these issues, low academic identification, right, that come along with athletic identity foreclosure. Um, and I'm a solutions man, right? I want to do solutions. So I started thinking about my own experience and how this could relate to ath athletics. And I realized that some of the pitfalls of athletic identity foreclosure are actually the benefits of studying abroad, right? So we lack self-efficacy outside of sports. But when you study abroad, you learn new things about yourself in new environments. You're socially isolated, right? There's grouping, there's tracking, there's all these things that keep student athletes only with themselves. What about if a student athlete was to go with a bunch of random students to South Africa, right? They get new peer groups, they get new networks. And now they're understand through a new lens. Delayed critical consciousness. Anytime you get outside this country, your consciousness is going to start going. Um, delayed career maturity and readiness. What I've noticed in my research, so I do a lot of research on black students and studying abroad, is that they're so much more prepared and more confident in their ability to get out into the world, right? We had a student who had never left an airport who went with us to South Africa. At this point, they're doing an internship in Singapore, been to six countries, right? It was just that one opportunity, so then they start seeing themselves as far more than just this person, right? Far more than just this kid from South Dallas. Now his, his opportunities for a position are literally all over the world. Research has also shown that GPA and graduation rates, specifically among black students, are heightened when they study abroad. 
identity development and negotiation, right? I think this is the most powerful thing because this is what plays with our ideology. This is what plays with the way we see the world and our own situation and where we fit within this world, right? So when I was in Africa, I got called white. I was like, no, bro, my dad is black. <laughs> Every time I went out the house, he said, you black, right? <laughs> But it was really challenging for me, and it, it messed me up for a while. But that was one of the best moments of my life because it made me realize these things about race and color that I was naive to, right? So I had to negotiate different parts of my identity and recognize that, ooh, when I'm abroad, actually the first thing that people recognize is that you're American, right? So I'm no, in America growing up, I'm, I'm black, yeah, maybe American, kind of, you know, second status, whatever, whatever. But when I was abroad, now you're you're American, right? I used to teach English in Korea, and somebody left something somewhere, and there was a joke going around. They were like, oh, man, somebody might steal that. And they were like, well, I know you won't steal it because you're American. <laughs> said, Whoa. No one has ever said that to me before, right? <laughs> so it was just powerful the way I was seen, right? You're in a different context. You get seen a lot differently. What blackness is in America is different from blackness in Africa, is different from blackness in Europe, and different from blackness all over the world. But oftentimes, our own understandings of blackness are stifled because of where we're located. So, and I want us to stay ahead of the curve, right? So, study abroad, international education is one of the most fastest moving things in higher education right now. But guess who's not doing it? Black students, and guess who's definitely not doing it? Black student athletes in revenue producing sports. But why, right? How does that shift in ideology of a black student athlete in a revenue producing sports challenge all the structures of the NCAA and, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I'd do a little sum if I was gonna come after you. Um, and the institutions we all work with that we're all complicit in, right? So I looked up four of the seven most universal job skills. I highlight the one in greens because those are all directly associated with an international educational experience, right? So a writer for the NCAA.com, it was published on their website, said, hey, study about changes in richer student athlete experiences. University of Nebraska recently sent some students, 18 students abroad, but I would challenge them and say, don't send them all together, send them with students, right? Allow them to explore these other parts of who they are as individuals outside of their athletic identity. So, what I've noticed as well is that we work with a lot of students. When I'm in front of students and I'm always talking about, yeah, I study abroad, I've been to 30 countries, yada, 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 the student athletes are interested. They want to go, right? We lead a study, a trip to South Africa and then to China. The students want to go. They don't think they can. So what is it about the structures on college campuses that make students think that they cannot go, right? So these, these are two quotes from two student athletes that I know personally who had the opportunity to study abroad. And the first one talks about how he realized that he was more than his body, right? He had a mind, and he could make a difference, right? The second one talked about, which I think is really interesting, because this gets at the idea of, well, hey, University of Texas, we sent all of our basketball players to China. And we sent them to Bahamas two weeks later. Like, that's great for the academics. Um, <laughs> But what he did is he went abroad as, a, as an athlete, right? But it was a lot different when he went abroad as an athlete compared to when he went abroad as Martin, right, as an individual. Because he was no longer grouped with all the rest of the athletes, it allowed him to explore parts of himself and his identity that had previously not explored. So, <laughs> right, going back to this book, right, um, it's a powerful book. And we think about mobility of African Americans in this country, historically, it's always been a main way to control, right? You can't even go to the plantation without a pass, right? And you look at student athletes now. Colleges, coaches can switch student athletes. Nah, if you go, you're going to have to sit out, right? They're controlled because the less you see, the more you know, right? So this is what I got from one of my students. This is what we get from all of our students. Why aren't you going to go to South Africa with us this summer? I got to work out. Says who? Says what? Right? Says coach. Right? I don't think my coach will let me. I can't miss practice. 
So they're student athletes when it's in the interest of the university, but then they're athlete students when it's in the interest of the university. Right? So we got to reclaim this word, and if they're students, they have to be able to take advantage of educational opportunities for students, like study abroad. It's 2015, we're in a globalized world. This is where we're going, right? We need a global skill set, we need a global mindset. Um, and those skills are provided through study abroad. So I don't want to just sit up here and talk and not lay out some sort of plan. Um, I think the first thing is you got to get black students to study abroad. We have a culture on this campus now for black students, they're studying abroad. If they're not, they're on the miss out. So the student athletes is all engaging too, like, now I'm missing out. Now I want to be involved. So you got to start with your base, which is black students. Two, you got to provide opportunities that fit their schedule, right? So here, we have a May Mester program that goes pretty much the month of June. They're not missing school. They're actually getting academic credits, right? They could do some push-ups, right? <laughs> They could get it in if they need to. They're not really missing anything that they need to be here for, right? And what you'll see is that there has been elite level student athletes across campuses who have the social platform to say, I'm going, so then they could go. But others are likely intimidated from going. So we need to empower student athletes to demand ac academic opportunities, right? We need to provide them the framework as to where they're demanding and it's not us, right? Look what happened when Missouri demanded something, right? All structures fall when the people who have the most power demand it, right? We just got to help student athletes realize that the power lies within them. Um, and lastly, we got to work within the athletic departments to make them realize how this is beneficial for the student athletes' personal and professional development, which in turn is beneficial for the athletic department and the school in general. So I'm doing some research on this. These are my next steps. I'm going to do a mixed method study. Um, and hope to get at this issue a little bit more. Thank you all for your time. Oh, stay up here. At this point, I'd like to invite all the presenters back to the stage for a question and answer period. And then if you would, audience, just raise your hand. I'll come around to questions. I hope so. My question about study abroad. So my university has one department that has a component that requires study abroad, and they're definitely pushing towards it. Is Maymester enough of an experience? So there's, there's, a, there's limited research out there on the impact that study abroad has, but certainly I would say four weeks is plenty enough time to challenge the way someone thinks about things. If you grew up in this country as a black person, any time outside this country, if it's in an educational experience, is going to blow someone's mind, right? But they can't be paraded around in full-on athletic gear in a team because then they're always going to be treated like of athlete rather than an individual, a human being, a person, and get to know people on a more human level. Question over here. Uh, first and foremost, Devin, I mean, profound man. It's, it's powerful to hear a young man like you speak uh, with such conviction and confidence. It's good to see. Uh, but my, one of my questions is for Dr. Roxbury. You talked earlier about how the um, people would constantly make criticisms about what the NCAA is doing. And I know you have other research, because I know the research you're doing, you, do, you guys are doing a brilliant job. At the same time, how are you articulating that message to the, to the masses so that people can understand what you guys are doing so that people are not looking at what some of the other scholars are putting out there negatively about the NCAA? All right. First, I just want to say that with this study abroad context, we have funded an institution. Tennessee State University uses, used some of our funding to send some of their student athletes abroad, and it was also with other students as well, so just want to say that. There you <laughs> go. Yeah, I like it, I like um, it. We, right now we're in the, like I said, the initial phases of the impact research of 
the, how the dollars were spent and impacted our class one institutions. Uh, but my plan is, is after we show that impact and show that the dollars actually made a difference in the academic outcomes, we want to devise best practices and then, and then disseminate them, not only to our bottom 10% of resources uh, institutions, but to uh, division one, division two, and division three as well, because we want some of our programs to be able to be replicated. And one of the outcomes that I didn't get to get to um, was that some of these programs that are designed for student athletes, the presidents have to be involved and they're also seeing the impact of them and so they're taking it to the general student body. So that's one way that we're trying to get it out there. But yeah, I think the ultimate thing is to develop this best practices list that we can uh, provide to other institutions. Uh, my question's for Rob. When you talked about uh, data analytics, what platform are you deriving that from? Is it something that you built specifically for athletics, or is it campus-wide? Is it from your LMS platform, or wh where is the data coming from? The, the, the data is being driven by um, the ba like basically the banner software. We have a web focus report that uh, takes all of the information from the banner system that the university uses to collect all the admissions data. Uh, and then I run it through literally my own, uh, just any spreadsheet type thing that I can put together and run it through SPSS and things like that. But all the data is being derived from the university and it's coming from, uh, we just have all of our groups uh, flagged and then extracted in, in based on their admissions term and things like that. So the university is collaborating with you, giving you what you need to analyze what you need to for the, for the For the two research reports we did, we did have the uh, institutional IRB approval for the for the two that we did. Now if I was to start again with something new, we'd have to go through the whole process over again. For the sake of time, this is going to be our last question. Um, and then after, I'm sure the presenters are at our next break will be more than willing to answer some of your questions. Um, I know I can't take everybody's questions. There's a couple of hands I couldn't get to, so please excuse that. But this will be the last one for this session. Questions for Ronald. Um, for the Bridge program, how did you implement and see, get the coaches to see the importance um, of the program and then also getting the student athletes to see the importance of, of the program as well and, and kind of mandate that for their attendance, et cetera? To be 100% honest with you, at my first institution, I didn't tell them because <laughs> they were, they were kind of totally against it. My second one, they were 100% for it. So at the first one, I just kind of told the students, hey, this is mandatory because if we're during their time, and you say it's mandatory study hall time, they're taking six hours, in our particular case of dance and leadership, how much study hall time do I need to allocate towards dance and leadership? So I turned that study hall time into some abridged time. Second institution, the culture's a little more, you know, kind of proactive, but you also have to equate it to, as somebody said earlier, kind of winning. So, you know, hey, if we get better student athletes, they can stay out here longer, they don't get arrested, things of that nature, they don't get suspended, then it kind of equates to winning. So kind of when you make that correlation, the coach is a little more nicer as far as getting, plus they're gonna register half the freshmen anyway, so, I mean, it's. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you, session two.